Well, we've just seen the effect uh, that we're seeking to achieve with this file, and I want to show you a bit about how it was set up. So we've got several sets of nodes here. We've got some lights over here. Um, we've got the backdrop element here. So I've just created some letters, uh, which are in fact stored in a file, and I bring them in, and then I make them into static geometry using the static object tool. Similarly, I've got a backdrop box, uh, and let's just uh, have a look at the view so we can see this. So we've got letters and we've got the box. So we're just two simple objects which our smoke uh, or dry ice is going to collide with. And as I mentioned, uh, these are part of the auto.network. So if we go into the auto.network we can see over here on the left hand side there's that static geometry being brought in and then it's merged in so that it collides with the smoke. So the next thing I need is an emitter for the smoke. So let me just switch on the display of the emitter so that we can see it and we can see it's this box here, it's just a simple box that is our emitter. So let me disable that again and let me show you how that's being used in our auto.network. So to convert that emitter into something which is going to source the smoke I used uh, the volume tools here and I used smoke from volume, this tool here. And this brings it into our auto.network and we can have a look at it here. Uh, and if you've seen the video on sourcing you'll understand a bit more easily what's going on here. But it's this apply source node which is bringing in that emitter geometry and in fact uh, we can see it if we enable the density guide here and I'm just gonna go up to the first frame so we can see uh, in fact we're seeing the sink as well that's uh, something we're going to cover later let me switch that off for the moment okay so we've just got now our source and we can see that although it was quite a big box, we've not got very much in here. There's, there's just these two areas which are creating smoke. And the reason for that is that we are doing two things to vary the amount of smoke or dry ice that's being emitted. So the first thing we do is to add noise. And because we've got the noise turned up really quite high, uh, this will reduce the number of areas which are actually going to emit. If I were, for example, to take this down to a value of 0.7, we can see that almost all the area is filled up with emitting material. But if we have this up at 2, we get these different areas and that's actually useful because we just want the smoke to come out of a couple of places but the other thing we want is for the location of those places to vary over time and in fact that's what uh, will happen here because this noise varies with time and the rate at which it varies with time is controlled by this flow frequency term here which I've set to 2 which means that it uh, varies reasonably quickly and we can see those bits of noise changing uh, it's not that clear in fact because we have something else happening uh, which is that we're varying the total amount of emission and we can see just now at frame 9 that's calmed down to 0. So let's have a look and see 
what we've done to achieve that. Well, what I'm doing here is using a motion effect network to vary the amount of emission over time. So we can examine the network using motion effects and this is off the video screen but there's a jump to effect network menu option and I've just used motion effects to be honest to create this uh, channel mode here which is going to which is bringing in that apply source emission amount so let's have a look and see in a motion view what this looks like we can see that it's initially got a value of zero. The other thing I do in this network is create a waveform. It's just a basic sine wave and there it is. Uh, and then I use a limit chop to cut off everything that's less than zero. So we end up with this sine wave that is always varying from zero to one. Uh, but that's a bit boring if we wanted our smoke to come out in bursts. Uh, each burst would be quite regular. So I want to vary the spacing between these and I can do that using a warp chop. And a warp chop varies the timing of one input according to another input. And we're going to use some noise. I'll just visualize that. And we've got some noise uh, which starts off being between minus 5 and 5. And then I use this math node so that it's varying just between uh, 0 and 2. And then I use the warp chop. And as we can see, what happens is that it varies the spacing of that waveform that was originally perfectly regular. But it doesn't vary the height, so we're going to get pretty much pulses of emission from our source and then we just export it back. Uh, now of course I could have hand animated uh, that parameter to get a curve that looks rather like this but it's often quicker to do it in chops. Just one uh, word of warning about this technique in chops which is by default uh, your channels will be bought in uh, with uh, or rather your noise or your waves will be created with a 10 second time frame. So that's because initially when I set this up uh, these animation options were set to 10 seconds. So uh, that's fine if you stick to 10 seconds. If you then change the length of your animation segment beyond 10 seconds you'll find that these chops mysteriously come to an end at a certain point so you need to make sure that all of them have the right end value that corresponds at least to the end of your animation. So that's how to vary uh, the emission amount and by the way we could have achieved the same thing by animating this parameter here uh, the emit smoke parameter. We could have just animated this and it would have had the same, of, the same effect as emitting this emission amount parameter here. So that's our sourcing. Let's now see uh, what things look like. And in fact I'm going to go back up to the object level and I'm going to disable simulation because I've in fact cached out the low resolution smoke simulation uh, and so we can view it more speedily and we can see that it comes down like this and it falls downwards and then as it gets to the bottom of this block it starts to fade out and that corresponds to what would happen to dry ice which would as it warms out as it warms up start to evaporate and we can see the pulsing quite clearly there that uh, is uh, the caused by the chop network uh, that we looked at a moment ago
So let's look at a couple of other things that we've done to make the smoke look like this. Well the first uh, thing we've done is to make it go downwards instead of upwards. As you recall, normally the buoyancy lift parameter will take some smoke and thrust it upwards if it's uh, got any temperature at all it'll start to rise upwards. Well by reversing the value of this and giving it a value of minus 10 then this smoke uh, will fall downwards. Now you might say well uh, why don't we just give the smoke an initial temperature of minus 1 instead of plus 1. Well that makes the shading and visualization a little harder later on so it's easier to start your smoke with a value of 1 and then it'll cool down to a value of 0 as it as it travels away from the source. Note by the way we give it some initial downward velocity to thrust it down onto our collision objects here. So more or less everything else on this pyrosolver is using the default values. I am adding a little bit of turbulence to the velocity field here in the turbulence tab uh, and that just helps create a bit more swirling in the smoke. Uh, the other thing that I'm doing to create swirling is I've added vorticals to the simulation and you can do that using the seed vorticals tool here and this creates two nodes, a recycle vorticals node here which we don't need to worry about and the vortical geometry node here and it's on this node that you set some of the parameters which will control how strong and your vorticals are and how many of them there are and we can visualize them like so and as you can see what I've done here is reduced the number it starts with a default of 5000 I've reduced them quite considerably but I've also increased the radius and the magnitude quite considerably and that produces slightly broader swirling motions in our smoke. The other thing I've done is use a gas dissipate node here and what a gas dissipate node does is reduce the density of the smoke according to the parameters here. Well, the field that's being reduced is density and there are two different methods that you can use to reduce this field. One of which is by multiplication in effect. So if we set this to 1, this evaporation rate, then this density would reduce from a value of 1 to a value of 0 over a single second. Uh, it's slightly easier to control the evaporation or dissipation using the evaporate by subtraction model and this means that every second uh, 0.2 is going to be taken off the smoke. So that over the course of five seconds the smoke will disappear completely. Now we've also enabled this, uh, in fact that shouldn't be enabled, but we've enabled this map control to subtraction rate scale and what this does this is a control field the control field is temperature and what this does is when the temperature is near zero then the amount of dissipation will be very high and when the uh, temperature is near a one then there'll be no dissipation at all so by linking it to the temperature field we can control uh, the evaporation or dissipation of this gas so that when it's cooling down around here it reaches a point where it starts to evaporate, evaporate quite quickly. Now the values here you have to achieve by trial and error. Fortunately dissipation is not something that is dependent on the size of the volume, the, the dimensions of the volume. So in fact what I've done here is create a take uh, low res which has a very low resolution uh, pyro container uh, and that will allow me to run the simulation more or less in real time and I tested various values of this evaporation rate until I got the effect that I wanted.
Now notice, by the way, that this dissipation node is wired in both to the pyrosolver and to the uprosolver. And the reason for that is that in order to visualize the dissipation at low resolution, I obviously need to have it attached to this pyrosolver. And if uh, I attach something to this last connector of the pyrosolver, that just adds an additional solver that will be run at every time step. So this dissipation solver is being run at every time step. Uh, so that will be reducing the density properly here on the low-res simulation. But that's not going to work when we come to up-res our simulation, because although up-res reuses several of the fields from the low-res simulation, uh, it doesn't reuse the density field. It recalculates the density field, but does reuse things like the velocity field. So this is creating a fresh higher resolution density field, and that won't be dissipated unless we also connect the gas dissipate solver to the final connector here of the up-res solver. Uh, so by having it connected here at the low-res, we can visualize it quite easily, and by connecting it at the high-res here, we actually make sure that the final gas, as uh, created by the up-res solver, does dissipate properly. Well, the next thing I want to demonstrate is uh, that we're using a sink. And a sink uses exactly the same apply, uh, source apply node, uh, but we're creating a sink relationship. And the geometry we're using for the sink, which we can see here, is a box uh, which covers the letters here at uh, the front. And the reason we need uh, this is because without it, the smoke would come down and it would pour over the top of the letters and it would obscure them. And that's not really the effect we want. We want to be able to see the letters and have the smoke travel around them. So as you'll recall, what a sink does, it removes smoke which gets into the space occupied by this geometry. And because it's sitting right over the top of the letters, the smoke will tend to uh, be eliminated if it tries to flow over the letters and we'll just get left with the smoke uh, that's flowing around the letters. But you'll notice that it's a little bit smaller than you might think we need. We're leaving a gap here in between the letters and the sink. And the reason for that is because we don't actually want to use this perfectly square object. What we want to do is feather it and this demonstrates uh, one of the other techniques that you can use using the source apply node. Uh, and I'm going to uh, just turn off the display of that sync geometry, go back into our auto.network, and I'm going to display the sync. Now if we look at this carefully, we can see that the sync is actually more or less touching the letters here but that it's slightly fuzzy on the outside. So the reason I've done that, uh, and what I've done is use the feather tab here to increase the outside distance a little bit, and then there's a curve here which gently falls off the density of this sink as it gets further away from the actual geometry. So I've feathered that so that this box has nice soft edges. And the reason I've done that is because if the smoke hits a very sharp edged box, it becomes obvious in the render that something is going on. You can see the outline of the box sort of cut into the smoke and it looks very unrealistic. By having the soft edged box, uh, we can more or less fool the eye into thinking that the smoke is just flowing either side of the letters uh, and you won't realize that in fact some of the smoke is being eliminated as it as it flows into this sink. So a little word about the workflow that's used to render this and I've already already done part of that workflow uh, and as you recall what you do in an uprest situation is you start with your switch simulation node set to low res. Uh, you then go into your low res pyro object uh, 
and you render out the frame range that you want. In this case I'm rendering 200 frames. Uh, and I've already in fact cached this out so it's loading up from the disk. The other thing uh, that you then do is go back into your auto.network, you switch uh, this to upres, and then you repeat the process of rendering out using the upres pyro node here, where there's an identical export to file option, and you render this out, and then you click load from disk, and then you have both of your uh, DOPS smoke simulations cached out and you're ready to render. Uh, I'm not going to repeat that now, but what I am going to show you is just one other uh, tweak on the Autodop network, uh, which is that I've used the scale time node here, parameter here, to slow down the simulation in the network and that produces a much nicer flowing motion of the smoke which is otherwise a little bit too quick for my taste so by decreasing this below one we slow everything down and make it look much nicer. So when you've uh, cached out your upres simulation you're ready to render. Let's have a quick look at the render nodes we've got here. So I've got a range node here which is writing out my files to disk over 200 frames. I've got motion blur enabled and we're just using the standard micropolygon rendering engine. So there's nothing particularly special going on here. We're using a couple of lights here in fact, uh, I've got a distant light adding a little bit of general illumination to the scene, and this doesn't cast any shadows. And then the main light is illuminating from the bottom here. This is a spotlight. I've decreased the shadow density just a little bit, and I'm using depth map shadows. In fact, this is uh, incorrect. It doesn't need to be have a value of 20 and I've got a little tiny bit of shadow blur on there and in order to render smoke correctly you need a little tiny bit of shadow blur otherwise you get uh, artifacts in the smoke render and I've given it a nice high resolution uh, and that's because the shape of smoke is generally defined by its shadows so if you have a nice high resolution shadow map you'll get smoke that tends to look nicer so in fact we can have a quick look at what that looks like to render. So let me switch this to our camera. And this should now render. Just thinking about it, it's rendering the depth map and now it's rendering the low resolution smoke. And finally just the shader I'm using. Uh, I've got a, a shader with a a color map applied here for the for the letters uh, but I'm just using a standard hot smoke shader I'm not applying any noise and I'm not applying any emission uh, I'm just using the density here to create that smoke so that's basically how to achieve the dry ice effect the only things that are particularly special about this scene are the use of the sink uh, the use of the pulsing emission in order to create the nice sort of waves of smoke. Uh, the fact that we are using a negative buoyancy to force it downwards. And then finally the, the use of the gas dissipate node to make it evaporate as it reaches the bottom of the scene here. So I hope that's been a useful summary of how to create this dry ice effect.